this morning i intend to speak to you on the use of technological innovations in future warfare and their impact on leadership and ethics in war as we move into the third decade of the 21st century with all the promise of further technological revolutions in modern warfare there are voices in some sections of the strategic community as also in the wider civil society suggesting that the nature of military leadership and the way leaders control their commands will need to change those who make this point seem to believe that technological innovations will replace military leadership as a driving force behind military effectiveness now according to them the emerging technological evolution and genders a fundamental change in human behavior or human nature the old days of leading by dash and bravado they feel are over and the specialist will replace the warrior at the head of combat formations and units now as someone from the old school as it were given my vintage permit me to contend that the reality is that wars will always be won by human beings men and women weapons may change but not human nature now human if human nature remains the same despite technological advances then motivating human beings must also have an enduring quality therefore leadership the dynamic of human motivation is as timeless as human nature in my view now different leaders may have different styles but leadership's substance does not change that is what has to be understood in context of the euphoria that surrounds the evolution of latest innovations in military technology and equipment from hypersonic weapon systems and precision guided missiles precision guided munitions to uh, the varied vehicles armed i mean unarmed uh, aerial vehicles and drones that are able to engage targets from great distances it is possibly not out of place to suggest that the fundamental patterns of behavior adopted by hunting apes thousands or millions of years ago still shine through the affairs of modern man we did not uh, i think evolve to live in huge conglomerations of tens of thousands of individuals our basic behavior in designed to operate in hunting groups or as part of a tribe limited to hundreds not thousands of members loyalty to and dependence on the hunting group and subsequently the tribe are expressed in the military by loyalty to the platoon or troop company or squadron or battery and the battalion or regiment that is the foundation on which most armies are built and certainly the indian army's motivation has been in that very sphere of activity now in so far as leadership is concerned one must understand that it is a psychological force that has nothing to do with ideals or idealism it is a matter of relative will power and the basic connection between one animal and the rest of the herd as it were leadership is a process by which a single aim and unified action are imparted to the herd not surprisingly it is most in evidence in times of or circumstances of danger or challenge leadership cannot be imposed like authority 
it actually needs to be welcomed and wanted by the lead. And in the military context, the officer is first and foremost the leader of men and women. He or she must lead by example and personal actions. They cannot manage their command to effectiveness. The force must be led. An officer must therefore get, set the standard of personal bravery and leadership. And here I can say with great pride that the junior leadership of the Indian Armed Forces has consistently done exactly this in all the operations we have undertaken over the years. They have always led from the front at great cost, I may add, because I think few other armies can match the officer to rank and file ratio of casualties as the Indian Army. We suffer more casualties than any other armed force in the world, I think, in this context. Now, a vital distinction that needs to be understood is that whereas the underlying map or paradigm of management is a thing, the underlying map or paradigm of military leadership is a person, is an individual. That being so, human behavior and traits become relevant. One of the foremost being that man is basically an aggressive animal. Prepared to kill, unlike other animals, which probably do only when absolutely essential. And whereas society and social behavior may have possibly undergone some change over the years, the innate aggression has varied little, sadly. One must also recognize that to display courage is still a virtue, a major virtue in society. As Field Marshal Bill Slim of World War II Burma campaign uh, famously remarked, I do not believe there is any man who would not rather be called brave than have any other quality attributed to him. Now reverting to technological innovations and capacities, it is perhaps most appropriate to dwell on the American example as the United States of America is without doubt the leader in the field and has also uh, perhaps been more involved than many other countries in uh, one way or the other by itself or together with other nations uh, in various parts of the world since World War II. A brief review of this involvement, I must say, it does not uh, unfortunately provide much to uh, make a case for the technological prowess of the United States of America. For all the technological capability and military might, their forces were uh, compelled to withdraw from Vietnam, despite the low-tech capabilities of the local adversary. In both interventions in Iraq in 1991, UN Security Council mandated one, as also the unilateral one undertaken in May 2003. The adversary was not in the same class or same league to merit any comparative analysis. The same is true of the Afghanistan intervention. Whereas, where I sad to say, despite over two decades of military operations, the American forces and those of their NATO and other allies, the Americans are getting ready to pull out under the facade of a questionable deal with the Taliban. The NATO intervention in Libya, under a dubious uh, pretense of being under the provisions of uh, the responsibility to protect concept, also produced questionable results, as evident from the continuing turmoil in that country. Now, insofar as the situation in Syria and Yemen are concerned, the less said, the better. I would, however, like to now focus on the NATO bombing of Serbia in 1999, as much because uh, there are some conclusions to be drawn from that action, 
as because of my personal involvement in the developments in that region in 1992-93, where I was the first force commander and head of the mission of the UN forces in the former Yugoslavia. The bombing in 1999 by NATO was undertaken ostensibly because the Serbian leader, Slobodan Milosevic, was indulging in genocide and war crimes against the local population in Kosovo, then a semi-autonomous region of Serbia, a charge for which he was subsequently arrested and arranged before a war crimes tribunal in The Hague for years. He died in custody before the tribunal uh, passed its final verdict. It is another matter altogether that the tribunal could not substantiate the charges of genocide and war crimes against him. But it is indeed a matter of great regret, deep regret, that some of the bombing was directed at civilian targets in Serbia to bring its leader to heel, which is what did in fact happen with Milosevic agreeing through some mediation by the Russians to the deployment of NATO and Russian forces in Kosovo to oversee an arrangement that was agreed upon. Now, together with many others from the national and international strategic community at that time, I was a strong critic of NATO bombing of Serbia, not only because it was undertaken, I think, under questionable provisions of international relations, but also because it violated some ethical norms of the conduct of war. It was therefore with some measure of comfort a few months after the bombing campaign, I came across an article that in many ways says it all. Not only in terms of the bombing campaign itself, but also in terms of the direction in which technology was taking us in waging war. And I can do no better than present to you relevant extracts from that article to reinforce the point I make. And here I quote extracts from an article titled, Ready to Kill But Not to Die, NATO Strategy in Kosovo, by a person named Paul Robinson, which appeared in the International Journal, in the autumn edition of 1999. Now, Paul Robinson was a former military intelligence officer who served in the British and Canadian armies. And this is what he has to say about that campaign. He says, honorable soldiers defend the innocent, respect their enemies and fight openly where their courage can be seen by all. In practice, this chivalric code is rarely, if ever, observed today. Nonetheless, it remains an ideal to which soldiers are meant to aspire. And for good reason, he says, because the soldier's sense of honor is the prime restraint on war. In its campaign against Yugoslavia, NATO showed it was willing to kill for its principles, but not to fight. Coming face to face with one's opponent and having to fight him causes one to treat him with respect to honor him as a warrior and restrain one's behavior towards him. And I say this as someone who's been through battle, who's dealt with an adversary in the battlefield. The pilot bombing a target, he says, from 15,000 feet, never sees his enemy, never even has to fight him, and thus sees no need to honor him or behave in a restrained way towards him. Now comes the the very uh, interesting part of his uh, article, I think. He says that Western leaders have become entranced by the idea of a bloodless techno war. NATO chose not the instruments that might do the job, but the instrument of least risk to their own forces. And he says, he questions, is this form of warfare ethical when it turns soldiers from warriors into mere killers. New technology, unfortunately, that allows nations to avoid friendly casualties 
has made it easier for them to initiate war without considering the consequences. War, therefore, has become more likely as a result. And he concludes by saying it was attacks on civilian rather than military targets that impelled him, that is Milosevic, to surrender. Now, this is a worrying conclusion. It suggests that if one is unwilling to take the risks involved in attacking uh, an enemy military force, victory can still be achieved by assaulting the civilian population. NATO's campaign escalated from limited war against the enemy's army for humanitarian objectives into total war against the Yugoslav civilian population to break its will to resist. Unrestrained warfare is surely not how modern democratic states should choose to conduct war. Force protection was achieved at the cost of others suffering. Avoiding friendly casualties cannot and should not be the main aim of any war. And let me sign off by uh, suggesting that the only modification to this uh, quote from Paul Robinson's article that I would like to add is to probably modify the point he has made about how bombing from 15,000 feet uh, was uh, without knowing what is, uh, one is hitting is replaced today by a technician sitting in a, an air-conditioned cubicle probably thousands of miles away uh, using, uh, uh, using his laptop to send precision-guided missiles against an adversary on the ground, be it in Afghanistan, Syria, or wherever. That, I think, is the frightening prospect that one faces today in terms of technological advancements and future warfare. Well, my, my name is Nambia, Satish Nambia, uh, retired uh, as Deputy Chief of the Indian Army in August 1994. It so goes back a long way. I was commissioned into the Indian Army in uh, December 1957, uh, served uh, uh, at various theaters. In fact, I did, uh, I was uh, inducted into Jammu and Kashmir with my battalion in January 1960 and served six and a half years at a stretch there as a captain and a young major and carried on and later in life served in the Northeast in uh, counterinsurgency operations. And among other things, I uh, uh, did my staff college in Australia. After that, did a staff assignment in the military operations directorate in Delhi. And then was with a training team in Iraq in the mid 70s, uh, did, uh, commanded a brigade. In fact, I raised the first uh, mechanized infantry brigade group of the Indian Army in 1992, and uh, subsequently uh, also commanded the mechanized division that was built up on that brigade. I've served as the uh, military advisor at the Indian High Commission in uh, London in the mid 80s, mid 1980s. And uh, the high point of my service career, of course, was actually two aspects, because in the, as a Lieutenant General, I was the Director General of Military Operations in 1991-92, when I led two delegations for talks with our Pakistani counter counterparts, uh, defense delegations with pa Pakistani counterparts, one in Delhi in, uh, in uh, uh, May 1991, and uh, the second one in Islamabad and Rawalpindi in uh, September 1991. And I mention this because my association with a number of our Pakistani colleagues goes back even further, but it, it, it enabled me, I think probably uh, I, without being um, too, uh, without sounding, uh, uh, trying to sound my own bugle or something like that, I think I must be one of the few senior officers of the Indian Army who had had so much interaction with our Pakistani colleagues. And uh, I could give you some, uh, some idea about that interact some other time. But the other high point was when I was nominated by the government of India as the first force commander and head of the United Nations forces in the former Yugoslavia. 
Uh, I commanded that force from March 1992 to March 1993, and I had the great privilege of having uniform personnel from under from over 34 countries of the world under my command. An outstanding uh, experience uh, with which I think uh, which would live with me forever. And I declined an offer of extension uh, and came back and, as I mentioned, retired as the uh, Deputy Chief of the Indian Army. And after retirement, soon after retirement, I was asked to take over an institution, a think tank here, the United Service Institution of India, where I was the director for 12 and a half years from July 1996 to uh, uh, December 9, 2008, 12 and a half year period, which again was as glorious a chapter as my service in the Indian Army. And a little later, I did four years at the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis as a distinguished fellow. And um, uh, I think there again, I stepped down uh, in 2015, I think it was, having had enough. And today I go around masquerading as an extinguished fellow. Thank you.